This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Quiet on the set. Soon we will all be more informed. We appreciate learning more of our region's news and public affairs. Cameras, Cameras rolling. rolling. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, when the statistics of crime in the city are the topic, the numbers are usually spiraling upwards. Well, lately, though, they have been going downward. We will investigate. For Baton Rouge area, Congressman Garrett Graves, his career once seemed to be climbing high. Now his chair has been taken away. Meanwhile, in Baton Rouge, Governor Landry was behind his desk signing a slew of newly passed bills into law while in New Orleans, a state police troop that he formed is on patrol. And in this, the week of Juneteenth, we will talk, take a special look at the historic influences locally of music. Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Mazani Ball, ma marketing manager, The Lens, Kevin McGill, reporter, The Associated Press, and Missy Wilkinson, staff writer, The Times-Picayune, the New Orleans advocate. And we will stay with Missy because the news is looking better, certainly about crime rates in the city and that they're heading downward. Which yes, is good. yes, I think it's safe to say they're looking really, really good, very much better, even compared to this time last year, which in itself saw a 25% drop from that just really crushing, terrible violence in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so far, violent crime in New Orleans is down across the categories about 26%. Um, that's according to data from the NOPD's analytics unit. Um, and driving that is, of course, like a really precipitous drop in murders. Um, we're seeing a 40 percent reduction in killings compared to the same time last year. We're sitting at about 65 murders right now. Around this time last year, it was closer to 100. Mm -hmm. um, so that is such a welcome and wonderful positive development. So is this in violent crime uh, only or just crime across the board? So the 26 percent is violent crime which includes murders, shootings, um, you know, aggravated batteries, things like that. But I think actually across the board, when you include property crimes, it's pretty close to that number too. Um, the only categories where we're seeing upticks actually are rapes and shoplifting. And I, I don't really have hypotheses for why that may be, but that is what the data is showing at this point. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, we welcome this drop, that's for sure, and we want to see it continue to go down. Yeah. But is this a national trend or is this unique to New Orleans? This this is a national trend. Um, so with these national trends, typically New Orleans tends to reflect them just to a greater extreme. Um, so, of course, you know, in this post-pandemic landscape nationwide, we saw violent crime really surge, and New Orleans was um, at the forefront of that trend. In 2022, we had the highest per capita homicide rate in the nation. It was among the highest in the world, among countries that were not at war. Um, but then when the reduction began to happen, about midway through last year in New Orleans is when we started to see that drop off. We actually dropped faster than almost anywhere else in the nation. And it seems like we're continuing to build on that. Um, so to a large degree, crime trends are somewhat inscrutable. You you really can't predict crime, um, but at the same time, you don't want to discount the concerted efforts on behalf of our law enforcement, on civic groups, local neighborhood leaders. Everybody has really kind of just thrown all their weight into tackling this crime issue in New Orleans, and thankfully, we're seeing dividends. Right, as NGOs as related, and civic organizations have been very, very involved too. Yes. Okay? Yeah, as much as it's related to drugs, are they are the curtailing of therefore or what? Drugs quite often are a factor in violent crime. And I think that you can see with a lot of these arrests, some of these people that are being taken off the street right now are involved in drug trafficking. You know, fentanyl is a factor in many of these crimes. Um, with some of these shutdowns of epicenters of crime, including the tire shop on 1200 North Claiborne Block, um, there was a high drug presence as well. The two are often linked. 
you know, carjacking is something mm -hmm. that we just saw skyrocketing. Yeah. And that has dropped significantly as well? Yeah. It has. What's it, happened there? It has. It's down about 50% as well. And, you know, there was a, some hypothesis that cars were just easier to snatch at points because of these viral Kia uh, hacks that allowed you to easily, you know, steal those cars. But that's not really a factor. The new technology has kind of made that harder to do. Um, but they're still down. And why? I'm not exactly, I'm not exactly sure, but it is great. <laughs> To so, see. in terms of you know NOPD and what it's doing and, and, and the law enforcement, et cetera, what what's going on there? Is it different deployment, scheduling folks differently, focusing on sp specific areas? What's going on with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that a large part of it is that we have an, a new chief who has very st strategically deployed the limited resources that NOPD has as far as its manpower. Mm -hmm. We now have civilian staff that we didn't have um, prior to this. Um, we also have amazing federal and local partnerships with departments, um, you know, Louisiana State Police, I know I'll speak about that later, but right. they've, um, the department, the NOPD has credited these partnerships to a large degree and these really functional working relationships with helping to catch some of these offenders. And um, law enforcement officials also say that it's often the small, small minority of people who are, are responsible for a lot uh, of the crimes. The thing with carjacking, it seems like they're catching them. That makes a big difference too. I mean, it's a high profile crime. And, 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 and we're hearing about results. I'm wondering, Missy, is there any indication yet that the, that slow, steady, or not even slow, steady loss of manpower at NOPD may be abating now? Are they, are they leveled off, or is it still a problem? So we're still sitting at around 900 commissioned officers at this point, um, with about 50 recruits in the pipeline. That's kind of where we've been for a while. Applications have dropped off pretty steeply. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to hit the chief's very ambitious goal of mm -hmm. a couple hundred officers. Um, the NOLA coalition projected that we would need to add about 150 officers a year in order to get the force back to 1,200 officers by the year 2030. It looks like that might not happen, um, but we are very strategically deploying the officers that we do have. And of course, we do have Troop NOLA, and we're going to be getting to that a little bit later on in the show. And But it's moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We want to see it continue to do so. Yes. All right, Missy, thanks a lot. All right, Kevin, over to you, because the governor has been super busy with his pen this week. A lot, a lot of bills signed, a lot of them dealing with education. One in particular that I wanted to take a look at, the, the, uh, this called an education scholarship bill. It's also being referred to as the GATOR program, the acronym meaning giving all true opportunity to rise. Uh, it, it's kind of a stripped-down version of a bill that was introduced uh, early in the session, and it's, uh, I don't want to say it's all aspirational. It is in state law now, and there are plans to start phasing it in. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the Council for a, a Better Louisiana, the watchdog group, noted, that it was kind of, uh, there's, the phase-in time, which was supposed to be three years, was, was kind of open, it made kind of open-ended. Uh, the idea is that sometime down the line, any family in Louisiana with a school-aged child will be able to avail themselves of some kind of voucher money. The, the, what's not known now, aside from when, is uh, how much. Uh, it's going to depend on uh, rules that, that, the, that the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education makes and how much money the legislature appropriates. But it's on the books now, it's, uh, and it will be a successor to the uh, Jindal era program, which was aimed only at uh, lower-income right. families with, with kids in, in lower-performing schools. And that continues as is? No, that will, this is what? supposed to supplant it. And I'm not entirely clear, because of the lack of rules, exactly how. They will be, anyone who's under that program will uh, graduate to this program, uh, or that's the plan. But again, some of the rules of that. Pro but this program doesn't really, does it exist? It's, it's, it exists in, in the law now. It's, the rules have to be done, and the, uh, and the appropriations have to be made. And the rules are going to be made now by Bessie. Bessie, yeah, Bessie's going to make the bulk of the rules. So yeah. when do we expect, I mean, will this, Will the rules be made by the beginning of the school, you know, the next school term, which is August? Well, some of the, yeah, again, it's going to be a limited program by next August mm -hmm. anyway. So the, I would think they should be able to, to, to move the, the existing scholarship students, and I don't know how many there are of those from the old program, and start the younger kids. And, and it's also aimed at more special education and lower income initially. I mean, it was, again, it was supposed to be a three-year phase in, mm -hmm. it may take longer than that. And again, the, 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 the mystery is 
will it be funded? How much will it be funded? How, how well will it be funded? How, and how much is it going to cost? That's yeah. a mystery too. If it goes, if everyone is eligible, I for suspect it. A, a reason why it kind of got stripped down over the process is there. There are a lot of people who are worried that it's going to take money away from mm -hmm. from public schools, right. and so that'll be a that that debate's going to going to continue over the years. Right. Another bill, uh, aside from education, one that we're really going to be talking about. It is an education bill of sorts. It's uh, the 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 commandment now that the Ten Commandments be placed on every schoolroom in every classroom. Uh, that receives and, state money. That receives state, well, yeah, I mean, every, every public state. schools, yeah. all public schools. Well, what, what about for schools that might receive state money, too? That was I, I'm not sure about them, but the, the, one of the key points that the, the uh, proponents of this bill make is it's not going to cost the state anything. They, they have to do it, but there's, I don't know about the teeth in this. I'm not sure who's going to enforce and, and, and how it's going to be enforced. Uh, a school system does not have does not have to spend its own money to put these posters up. They can use donated money, or they can get someone to donate the the posters that 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 uh, conform with the state's. But uh, they must put the posters. They up. are supposed to put the posters up. Now we've already had an interview. We interviewed the teacher of the year from 2020, who said he's not going to do it. He says it's unconstitutional and it's it's going to make. And it's, it might make some of his students who aren't uh, of the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, feel feel put upon. Uh, but it may be enjoined at any rate uh, by by a court. Uh, the ACLU and, and uh, People for the American Way, I believe, or People for Separation of Church and State, any number of groups are expected to to file suit either uh, before it's it's uh, even they, anyone tries to enforce it if they can have standing or, or otherwise so that will cost the state to defend it it will cost the state to defend it that's 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 more than likely and uh, the, the governor said he uh, reportedly said he can't wait to be sued so that's mm -hmm. given rise to two two uh, opinions either he wants it for his own publicity and his own political ambitions or and or People, uh, conservatives around the state <clears throat> and around the nation are seeing a, a rightward-leaning Supreme Court, and they, they think they might be able right. to move it a little farther right in, in terms of uh, freeing up uh, the Establishment Clause. Well, this really made a national splash, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, something else. Yeah, uh, other than the Ten Commandments, uh, okay. the, the, uh, Tuesday, the, uh, the, the governor signed a bill allowing judges to sentence certain sex offenders whose victims are 13 or, or younger, or younger than 13, to physical castration. This is the only state in the nation that does that. Uh, that might face some, uh, that will almost certainly face some challenges from, uh, from, from uh, criminal defendants. But uh, the, the upshot of the bill is that, that if a judge decides that it's a, a, a punishment that's warranted, a prisoner who, who refused could have more uh, years added on to, to, to the sentence. And this applies to men and women? Did I yeah, yeah you know, I've been told uh, by someone in Baton Rouge, or one of our correspondents in Baton Rouge, that yes, they, they, there's, there's a, it, it applies to men and women. I think everyone is assuming that it's going to be uh, men, but it, it, it applies to men and women convicted of certain sex crimes with, the, with young victims. The only state in the union to have this? Only state in the union to have this at this point. And there was a veto that we were surprised by. Yeah, the, the governor, and, and this is worth noting, it's, it's a complex bill, but it was eventually, it was essentially a bill to aid uh, insurance companies can perhaps reduce some of the payouts they would have in tort cases wrong uh, cases over, over any number of damage uh, suits and uh, the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry and any number of, of uh, business interests wanted the governor to sign it the insurance commissioner wanted the, the governor to sign it the governor uh, vetoed it which which I almost want to liken this to the 70s when, when Governor Edwards, Edwin Edwards, signed the right to work bill to the horror of uh, organized labor. This was uh, govern, uh, a Republican governor vetoing a bill everyone thought that, that he would philosophically be in favor of. But it's been noted that the governor took a lot of campaign contributions from the, the plaintiff's bar this year. And uh, aside from any political obligations he might feel to them, uh, this is a kind of, there's a kind of conservative populism growing. He, yeah, remember, John Bell Edwards did get elected in the state as a Democrat, and I think you're, you're seeing the, the governor with some very hard social conservative uh, values and, and still a, a pretty pro-business pro bent, but also uh, he, he held a news conference with someone who benefited from the bill, mm -hmm. and I think it's a more of aimed at a working class uh, uh, electorate. Right. 
All right, very busy time. And, yeah. uh, you know, we haven't heard the last of some of this, too. All right, Correct. Kevin, thanks a lot. All right, Mazzani, over to you, because you wrote a piece that sort of threads music um, along with African-American, black, people of color history in our city. And this is all in the context of, of, of course, observing Juneteenth this week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I felt like it was important to uh, educate people on the history or the rich history of music as it relates to African-Americans in New Orleans and more specifically uh, as it relates to opera music and jazz music because these are forms or genres of music that we have been traditionally excluded out of. And I think for as long as uh, opera music has existed in New Orleans, black people have been a part of that and also has used music as a medium to drive this vehicle of resistance and oppression. Right, of freedom, an expression of freedom through their music, through dance, et cetera, right. over the years. So with opera, let's start with opera. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some composers who are major composers. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about this? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of composers that, you know, uh, sprung up about in the early 1700s and 1800s in New Orleans, and that was mainly in part responsible for the Haitian Revolution. Um, a lot of um, refugees and people came to New Orleans um, to start a new life, but in what is now Haiti, they began uh, opera very early, and so a lot of people were in that industry. So um, composers such as Edmond Dede, mm -hmm. who went off to Paris and performed and composed uh, a plethora of compositions and classical music. Mm -hmm. There's also Victor McCarty, who um, stayed locally and also spearheaded a boycott against the French Opera House for discriminatory practices. Um, and there's also Brazil Barre, who was enslaved at the time, but was one of the first African Americans enslaved to receive copyright for his compositions. Mm -hmm. So at the time, you know, while he's enslaved, he's publishing pieces and making music and was widely known for the work that he was doing. So we have a rich history of uh, free people of color and African Americans in New Orleans that were in the opera scene, but also. Um, at the time, there were a lot of uh, enslaved Africans that would put aside money to see the opera. So this was everyday music for people. This was just like pop music as we would listen to today for them. And then, of course, you know, there was the music in Congo Square, mm -hmm. the enslaved people um, going to Congo Square. I think you had a picture that accompanied yeah. the, your, your piece in the paper, if we can maybe bring that up right now, of a beautiful sculpture mm -hmm. depicting that. Um, and then that music, as you said, continued on to, you know, through also the contributions to the development of jazz, right. and um, and then continued on now to, um, to to the music of today, certainly, mm -hmm. and then in second lines, our you know our tradition of second line. Right. Uh, so music was more than just an enjoyment for dance, but as we said an expression of freedom, too. Right, exactly. And when we think about places like Congo Square, Congo Square is um, a historic landmark here, and it's very important in this uh, discussion about Juneteenth and freedom, specifically because on Sundays, this was the day that um, enslaved individuals would go to Congo Square and participate in uh, dancing and music and different things like that. And fast forward to now, that's something that we still practice every Sunday. If you go out to Congo Square, you will see djembes and junjuns and African American, African uh, drums that mm -hmm. people play. And it's still a form of release and still a form of liberation. And specifically for Juneteenth, they took it to Congo Square and celebrated right. the holiday. So that, you know, that expression of music and development of music, our culture in New Orleans, but it's spread throughout the world. Absolutely. It's meant a lot to throughout the world. Well, it's a beautiful piece, and it's at the Lens, right? The Lens.org? Yes. Org? yes, the Lens, yeah. uh, LensNola.org Lensnola is where you org. can find the piece. Okay, thanks a lot, Ms. <laughs> of course. Really, really enjoyed hearing about that. All righty, e, over to you. Um, Congressman Garrett Graves has said he's not going to seek re-election. Yeah. Um, about a year ago, in May of 2023, 
one of the big, well, the biggest issue in Congress was a, a debt ceiling. Um, and it was one of these things that the federal government might shut down, and we're getting close to it. It was what everybody was talking about. And the, uh, the House created a delegation. The, I mean, the, the Democrats did, the Republicans, the, the White House, they all met together to try to resolve this. This was a major, major story. And you look at some of the newspaper coverage of, of that day, and you saw headlines like this one, right? This was from NPR. <clears throat> said, low-key Louisiana lawmaker tapped to help GOP debt negotiations. All of a sudden, people were saying, who's this guy, Gary Graves? Mm -hmm. I mean, with all the big names in Congress uh, and in the White House who were working on this, and, and some guy named Gary Graves, well, he was a congressman from Louisiana. Uh, he, he was a supporter of Kevin McCarthy, who was the, uh, uh, the Speaker of the House, who had been elected that January, and who backed him and helped his campaign, who was very much respected by Kevin McCarthy. So Gary Graves was in the middle of this. He may have been, like, the most important guy in Congress uh, during that period of time. And so if you think between May 2023 and a year later, like, he was at the top of the world, and now he's out of office, essentially. And what happened? And it, and it, it certainly wasn't because of a lack of intelligence or a lack of performance. It was just the politics, the free districting. Uh, that the, the mandate was to have an extra black majority district. And in doing that, they had to get rid of one of the districts, which was a, a white majority district. And so which one would it be? And it settled on graves. Uh, he he'd angered some people. Some people were disappointed when there was, uh, uh, when McCarthy left and there was a, a vacancy of Speaker of the House that he didn't back uh, Steve Scalise. Um, he didn't um, back Landry for governor. He, he kind of um, he, he, uh, he backed Waggis back instead. And so for various reasons, the politics didn't work in his favor. And the district was drawn so that his district, what remains of his district, the 6th district, would have a white majority. Now, now, to get that, it runs across the street. I mean, almost, okay. And, um, and so that, that's the new district. At first, he said, look, <clears throat> and the congressman doesn't have to live in the district that he runs in. And so he could have run in any district. But, and so he first said, look, I'm going to run. I'm, I don't know what district I'm going to run in, but I'm going to run. But then during the week, he decided, well, no, I'm not going to run. And I'm, the cost is prohibitive. Um, he would pretty much have to be running after one of, against one of his Republican colleagues. And so right. he made the announcement. So he, yeah, which surprised a lot of people because he had been saying, you know, just declaring yeah, yeah. most firmly that he was indeed going to run. Now, he is also of the opinion that this new you know, majority, uh, minority district, the, the, the new district, that has been carved out. It stands for this election, but it still needs to be revisited or could what possibly happened? be revisited. It was going back he and believes forth. that it's going to be overturned. It was going back and forth with, um, with the Supreme Court and the local courts, and finally right. the Supreme Court said, look, you got to do something. Let's put this latest plan in. And so they implemented the plan, but they knew there was a possibility right. it might re be reviewed within the so, two years. And so it might be reviewed. And that was one reason he said, you know, it wouldn't be fair um, for me to run in this district and then for it to be changed right. again. But somebody's going to wind up losing uh, in this um, one right. way or the other. So, so the other possibility is his running for Senate against Senator Ca uh, Cassidy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he has expressed that this is not really something that he wanted to do. But no, of course not. He really not. sort of had no choice to do it. So, yeah, um, he wasn't so, looking for being thrown out of but office. But a change no. of fortunes, that's for sure. But we'll see what's in his future. Okay, okay. Lee, thanks a lot. And quickly over to you. Um, let's let's talk about the troop NOLA. Um, to you, Missy, um, they've been really pretty active and getting yes. a lot of headlines as well. Yes, absolutely. Especially last week, a number of uh, incidents ended in collisions um, involving the suspect vehicles fleeing from potential arrest in just about all of the cases. Um, and yeah, they seem to be really ramping up patrols, ramping up arrests. Last week, they reported they did 100 traffic stops, resulting in 20 arrests. And some of these were some pretty big arrests. Mm -hmm. uh, at least one of them is going to be tried federally. Um, FBI was one of the scenes that were on the, or one of the agencies that was on the scene of the arrest um, last week at uh, Claiborne and Toledano. Um, that was an incident in which police tried to pull somebody over. That individual was a 19-year-old um, named Jadakus Williams, who was allegedly driving a stolen car, allegedly had weapons and guns. But, but they are crashed. I mean, they are, they're chasing. And then we have seen crash, cr crashes, which NOPD cannot give chase um, unless it's, it's, it's really a very, very threatening scene. But generally, they're not giving chase to cars. 
Chupnola is. Yeah. How's that going over? Yeah. So, I mean, the parameters for the NOPD are far more narrow than Louisiana State Police. And some people are uncomfortable with that because you see lots of fallout, including loss of life, damage to property. We did see a civilian suffer minor injuries in the Lakeview chase, the, lake, mm -hmm. the one that ended in Lakeview. So I think that some people are anxious and uncomfortable about the increased possibility of, 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 of chases. How are they making the choice to get involved in something? So according to their policy, from what I could see, Louisiana State Police, their pursuit policy allows them to pursue anybody who doesn't stop for a traffic stop. Um, and NOPD is, is, you know, much more specific in that it has to be someone who is um, a violent criminal and they have to get authorization by their supervisor. But it does seem that LSP is kind of just chasing people that don't pull over. And their other indicators are they've all been in stolen vehicles, or most of them have been. They are driving erratically. That's kind of what we're seeing with these incidents. Well, they are patrolling certain areas. Yeah, you know, we're seeing, based on what I've seen, which is limited, I don't have a great sense of everything that's happening, um, but they do seem like they're heightening their efforts in Central City, which is where we've seen at least six murders happen this year, um, and then along that Elysian corridor in kind of mm -hmm. like the St. Rock area. So more high crime areas is where they're going. You know, state police have traditionally nationwide been like traffic cops, but they've been highway traffic cops. Are they being trained now for this kind of thing? This is a different thing than what state police used to be. Yeah, it is a different thing, and that's something some, that NOPD officers have talked about, is just mm -hmm. the policy and cultural mismatch. Um, I understand that LSP has received some de-escalation training, and I don't know what other additional trainings right. they're going to make to adjust to the culture here. And they've had right. a well, role here, though, during Mardi Gras, and, mm -hmm. and, and right. they've yeah. had some urban policing experience here over the years. Yes. And then, of course, we will continue this conversation another time, because I'm sure it'll be coming up again. Yeah. It's time now to go to other stories real quick. E. Yeah, it was announced this week that Alaskan Airlines is going to, is going to start in January, a, a seasonal nonstop flight between New Orleans and Portland uh, between January 1st and, and May 25th. So the, idea, the, the question may be, why would anybody in New Orleans want to go to Portland, if you've been reading about it, if you want to take a cruise, okay? That, that's a, uh, that's a, a gateway to cruises. It's, and, it's a beautiful part of the country, too. too. Mazzani? Um, I'm working on a story with uh, black art collectors in New Orleans and how they're using art as a way to to have sustainability. Okay, we'll be looking for that. Thanks a lot, Kevin. There's a federal rule enforced by the Biden administration that says employers have to give time off and make other accommodations for women who are, are getting an abortion. A federal judge in Louisiana said empl some employers, the states of Louisiana and Mississippi, and I believe it's the United States Conference of Bishops challenging that rule, mm. judge ruled in their favor. It's very limited right now to Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, but of course it'll play out in the federal courts here. In, uh, in western Louisiana and then at the Fifth Circuit in the coming months. All right. Missy. I'm really hoping to have a sit down with Ann Bro uh, next week, who, of course, this week had a total win in court against Mayor LaToya Cantrell when the judge sided with her and said that Cantrell's petition for protection against alleged stalking um, did indeed violate Ann Bro's civil rights, constitutional okay. rights. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Very great conversation. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you all for joining us, too, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Inform Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.